So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ahmaduhu wa salli ala Rasulil Kareem, amma ba'd. Today I want to talk about the processes that are taking place to dehumanize Muslims in the media and the world at large. Um, this is a very important topic because this is where the world is heading. And for, the, for a large part, mo most Muslims are not realizing it because they're not seeing overt things happening against Islam. But underground things are happening so i wanted to talk about how the idea of free speech like we could say whatever we want about the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we can you know in the name of free speech you can say anything but what happens as a result of free speech and this idea came to me by an email that a brother from denmark wrote to me which i'll be reading to you soon inshallah but the idea of free speech leads to de dehumanization. You abuse a person, uh, you abuse a people, you abuse their religion, you make them less than human beings. And then the Muslims themselves begin to believe that and they start, start to adapt something that some psychologists have called self-hating phenomenon, that you begin to hate yourself and so you become liberal in something other than who you are to be. So let me start at something very basic. Let me just read this email to you that was written to me by brother. In Denmark, we Muslims for a long time have been suppressed and subjugated to the most racist and oppressive treatment by the Danish media, politicians and state. You all know the infamous Quran burning that has been going on for a long time now. I personally see a direct link between the Qur'an burning and the terrorist shootings like this, meaning terrorist shootings against Muslims, which there have been quite a few. And I don't want to go into that right now, but people that are going to hate Muslims and treat Muslims as a hate object, uh, there is a link between what happens in the propagation of the media and then how they are treated, as we'll shortly see. If the Danish state media and lawmakers allow even and even encourage the events like Quran burning, oh yeah, say anything you want against Prophet Muhammad, it's okay. And then the result is you dehumanize the Muslims and the result is that Muslims become target of your hate physically. So encourage events like Quran burning in the name of democracy and freedom of speech, then it will create young Danish terrorists like this young man we will unfortunately experience many events like this. We are we Muslims are dehumanized in the eyes of the Danish people. Hence, our lives have no value in the eyes of the Danish people. So, one aspect of the dehumanization of the Muslims is done by the media. The second is as the economy begins to go down in Europe and in America and in other places, what will happen People always want to blame someone, and the politicians are not going to blame themselves. They're going to blame the outsiders that have come in, the outsiders who have taken your jobs, the outsiders who are taking your resources, the outsiders who have made everything bad in, at home. So they will dehumanize. The economy will create a situation where people are going to be in anguish, and the worst is going to come out, and Muslims will be a target, and that target will be the result of the dehumanization with the media and the bad economy. It's going to be a very bad combination. So Muslims need to get ready for this. And then I was saying there's a third element is that Muslims that begin to believe the media. Yes, we must look at all these. Look at what the media is saying. It's true. Muslims are so bad. Muslims do so many bad things. And in Europe, it is true. Muslims do many crimes, unfortunately. But the result of the good Muslims is they begin to have self-hate and then they become liberal Muslims trying to run away from the, who they actually are. And so we're, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But first, let me just show you a couple of things, inshallah, in this regard. And I want to say, look, the Quran makes it so clear. The Islamic stance is, is very clear. We do not make fun of anyone's gods. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, don't make fun of their God, lest they make fun of your true God. Don't make, don't dehumanize them by dehumanizing their churches and their synagogues and their, 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 their things that they worship, even if it not be true. 
right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says there's a limit. Arguments are there. Rationality is there. Even sarcasm to bring about the truth could be allowed. But to make them a target because of their religion, la ikrah fit. There's no compulsion in deen. And you don't dehumanize them. If you want to give that one to somebody, you can't dehumanize them. If you want to bring them, invite them to Islam, you have to increase their sense of humanity and their fitrah. And so, uh, let me start by this verse of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولا تصبوا الذين يدعون من دون الله Don't curse, don't insult those who call other than Allah. فيصبون الله عدوا بغير علم and then they will insult your Allah without any knowledge. Okay. كذلك زينا لكل أمم أعمالهم. This is how Allah Subhanahu wa Taala we made it seem this ego trip. You know, I made fun of you. I'm good. You know, this أعمال, this deed that you do, it looks good, but it's not good. It has very bad negative effects. And then what does Allah say? You and them, you did that did wrong by cursing their God, and they that are worshiping the wrong, you're all going to go back to Allah, and Allah will let you know what you did. So, and then in another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear that don't break down the churches and the synagogues and the masajids, because Allah's name is mentioned here. When you break down people's churches or their synagogues or their places of worship, you are pro beginning the process of dehumanizing them. When you make fun of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu you are dehumanizing the Muslims. Okay, you are making them less than human beings, and you're saying that they're stupid and that they don't know what they're doing and that they're not human. And so, anyway, let's continue from here now. So. This is an article also expressing the same idea, more than hurt feelings, the real danger of hate, spe uh, hate, hate speech. And, you know, uh, white supremacy, ban Muslim wall, Trump, you know, all this type of stuff, uh, hail uh, Trump. Uh, this type of dehumanization uh, is extremely, has very bad effects on people. What dehumanizing speech, what is dehumanizing speech? You know, of course, they will apply this rule of dehumanizing speech for the LGBT community, for the uh, the Jewish people. But when it comes to Muslims, you know, uh, it's it's all freelance. It's all open air. It's all like uh, fire at will as much as you can. It's because this is what democracy is. And this is, but for Jewish people, you can't make fun of their religion. You can't make fun of their history. You can't make fun of the Holocaust and so on and so forth. Dehum because they're not willing to allow themselves to be dehumanized. But it's okay to dehumanize Muslims via the media. Here's an actual hypothetical experiment that was done. Um, a hypothetical neurological association between dehumanization and human right abuses. Meaning, the places in the world that have human rights abuses is the places of the world where humans are dehumanized. And so very soon you'll find, as we are finding, that the dehumanization and then physical assault, including human abuses, are going to happen to Muslims, particularly in the West, particularly as the economy becomes, begins to fall. The normalization of hatred, identity, effective polarization, dehumanization on Facebook, and the context of tractable political conflict. Now I want to mention that we live in a time of a different type of war. War isn't just guns and machines and tanks and F-16s. That's not the only type of war. Media is a major form of political war. The social outlets are a major form of fifth generation war. And so we are in essence under attack as Muslims. Okay, We are being dehumanized as Muslims. We're also being dehumanized because Everyone is being shown in the world Muslims are abused all over the world. And when you have a, and research shows this, that when you have a mob mentality that, oh, it's okay to abuse a certain group of people, then people are more prone to abuse those people. And so therefore, you're going to find more and more vicious attacks on the Muslims in the coming years. Dehumanizing speech is still free speech, and some people will defend it. 
They will defend it like a holy cow, like some sort of god, except when it comes to certain people and certain groups. But for human, for Muslims, free speech means fire at will. It means shoot. And, and, and it has more dire consequences than actually war. Now let me share with you what Washington Post wrote. Muslims, we found, are the most readily dehumanized groups. Our American participants rated Muslims at about 12 to 15 points lower than Americans on our scale. So, uh, Washington Post has an article called Americans see Muslims as less than humans. Okay, so meaning the process of Muslims being dehumanized, Islam being slandered, that process has already begun. Okay, so Rand Corporation, which is a think tank, you know, did this article or essay on U.S. strategy in the Muslim world after 9-11. And they want to do certain things, and I want to point out one of them, okay, uh, which is called Support Civil Islam. Okay, Support Civil Islam. What does that mean? That means that uh, you have to create a situation where Muslims want to be civil. They want to not be radical. They don't want to, them to be, they want them to fit in society. And in order to fit into society, they have to attack you so that you will then not be that thing that they're attacking and then you will be something other than what they're attacking. And so you have to be part of civil democratic uh, society, right? So they don't want khilafa. They don't want Islam. They don't want Sharia. They want a secular, godless state that somehow then is supposed to be creating uh, or is, is supposed to satisfy the Muslim world. And that can only happen if the Muslims are thoroughly brainwashed. If you remember the shooting in uh, the Christchurch, online dehumanization of Muslims made the Christchurch massacre possible. And then there is, of course, this uh, phenomenon that I've just talked about, is this phenomenon of uh, like self-hate, you can say. Um, so there are many self, how, col how colonial mentality taught me to hate myself and how I fight against it every day. So this happened to Indonesians, Malaysians, anyone that was occupied by the other, you end up loving or wanting to be like the one who occupied you, right? And so the, the Jewish people also recognize this self-image and self-hatred. And this is what we have a lot of Muslims who, despite their self-image and self-hatred, will not be able to escape the dehumanization process that is taking place. And so it's going to be doubly worse for them. On the one side, they'll be like, well, I did everything you wanted, and you're still not happy with me. On the origins of Jewish self-hatred. And the Jews also talk about this. Right? So what's the lesson here today? The lesson here today is that as Ukraine, through its Nazis and fascists, recruits more KK-type people and creates more KK-type people, more of the white supremacist people on the one side, at a very high pace, which, inshallah, I will talk in detail about soon. On the other hand, what is the media doing? And what is, where is the economy going? And this process, and, and Washington Post is already saying, the dehumanization of the Muslims has already occurred. So where does that put the future generations? Where does that put the future of Islam? What are we supposed to do in response the only thing to do in response to this is that we Muslims, rather than being part of democratic this and republican this, and think that this is the only way to have a political voice, which again, uh, you're not thinking, to me at least, you're not thinking Quranically, and you're not thinking prophetically. In a situation where two parties, whether it's the labor and the conservative or whatever two party systems there are in the Western world, Whatever party system you have, unless the Muslims are not in a jama'ah and they don't have an emir, 
and they're not working amongst themselves in this process that the prophetic process taught us that you must have an emir, you must have a jama'ah, you must have your own culture, you must have a society within a society, you must create your own bubble in which you can raise kids to engage with the larger society but is not part of the melting pot. You know, they say the first generation loses the language. So if you are Pakistani, your children don't know, don't know Urdu. Or your children don't know Swahili. Or they don't know Arabic because they were born and raised here. And so most of the Arabs, their children, they don't know Arabic. Most of the Pakistanis, their children, don't know Urdu. So what happens in the generation after that? They lose the culture. They lose the falafel and they forget what is biryani. And the third generation will lose the religion. But this thing that is happening with us right now is going to increase that and speed up that process even more. We already have statistics that 25% of the Muslims are no longer claiming to be Muslims amongst the Muslims that are growing up in America. So what do you think is our future of the Muslims? We are in a very difficult situation. So unless you don't create a bubble, in which you can protect yourselves. You have a jama'ah, you have Islamic knowledge, and you have Islamic families coming together. You have sources of knowledge, and you create, it's because there's no society without marriage and families, so you create families. You bring Muslims together in the form of a family. And all the families should bring back their families. Now, if you have your brothers and sisters living in separate parts of America, this is the time to think about bringing them all together. I'll be talking about this soon. This is very important for the future of the Muslims and the future of Islam. And you bring together your families. You bring back your brothers and sisters together. You bring back your in-laws from the different relatives you have together. You bring them all back. You form a jama'ah, you have an emir, and you create your own bubble. And you do the politics of Islam, which is radical, because it is politics of doing da'wah. It is about teaching people about Islam. It is about building alliances with good Christians who actually hold Christian values. Not secularized Christians, but real Christians. Those Christians who will try to uphold the true teachings of the Bible. You form a jama'ah. If you form a jama'ah that is of that type, then what will be the result? It will be what happened to Malcolm X. What happened to Malcolm X? They asked Malcolm X, what do you want? What can we do for you? That's when you become a jama'ah under one emir. And there doesn't have to be one emir in each location. There can be different, but you're working in the Islamic system where you have an emir and you have a shura, and you're doing your jama'ah and you're creating a society within a society. And Muslims need to start living not in suburbia, but living together in like the ghettos. The ghettoization is the only form of protection that the black people in America have. The ghettoization was the only form of protection the Jewish people prior had in Europe when they were being oppressed. It is necessary for Muslims to come together and to pull their resources together. So you bring Muslims together where they occupy an entire block, an entire half mile, entire five miles, living together. Instead of living alone in the suburbia, you live together. You form your, for you form your stores together. You form your communities together. This is the only way for the future. That you must have a jama'ah. And this jama'ah must be ready to move out of the cities. This jama'ah must get prepared and must do fatuwa. It must prepare its youth on how to live without technology. That's the only way you're going to survive now. You cannot survive living in the suburbs where your neighbor is being taught to hate you and to dehumanize you. And your neighbors don't have a very good understanding of you and your religion. And nor have you ever reached out to them to share your religion to them. You're not doing your job and they have a bias and they go to their nearby church. 
or they go to their nearby clubs and whatever in which they have their own political agendas and you've been isolated. So Muslims need to get ready. They must form a jama'ah. In this time and age, the Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you must form your jama'ah. Without a jama'ah, you will be singled out. And shaitan, shaitan is the one with the one who is alone. So if you're a Muslim family or a Muslim living in suburbia or somewhere out there 10 miles away from the masjid, 10 miles or hundreds of miles away from any Muslim community, you need to move. And not make your job or your business or your trade or your whatever you got as your priority of your life of where you live. You need to make Islam your priority of where you live. That means you need to live by a masjid. And not a masjid is nothing. It's just a building unless there's a community there. You must move to where there's a community, a Muslim community. So you can act together in times of crisis. Muslims will come together, but they have to be living together. And this is not a time where Muslims can think, I mean anyone would be blind, any Muslim would be blind who thinks that that the future is uh, very bright for Islam and Muslims. Because the way things are going, we're headed for a deep economic, this is not one of those economic recessions that comes down and then goes back up. They've been able to pull themselves up many times, but how many times will they pull themselves out of the ICU? the intensive care unit. So those people that know, know. And those that are blind are so blind that they just, they're not only blind, they have a finger in their eye. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect and guide. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.